the art of peaceful living. So, just a couple of um, quick thoughts, as I said, that came up on Sunday. Uh, one is the very beginning of this chapter, words of the Buddha, which I think are truly wonderful. Overcome the angry by gentleness. Overcome the mean-spirited by kindness. Overcome the greedy by generosity. Overcome the deceiver by truth. And those words sound so simple, but we tend so often to go in the other direction. Fight back, strike back. And the Buddha is saying, you don't have to do that. You have more going on within you. But I have to really love those words. Now, the idea, something that we've spoken about a number of times, that when someone says, I'm an impatient person, or I'm an angry person, or I have a lot of anger, we say that sometimes as if that's the way we were born, and that's the way we're going to be, because it's in my DNA, I'm hardwired that way. You know, now, in fact, only last week, there was a big article in, in the New York Times saying this whole idea that we are hardwired a certain way has now been proven to not be true. Because the Buddha said it a long time ago. But don't get caught in this idea that that's just the way I am. Because, as we're about to hear, everything is changing. From the Buddhist perspective, one might say there are no nouns. There are only verbs. All phenomena are in a constant state of change. The true condition of all things is that of becoming. Becoming something new in each minuscule time frame. Nothing is static. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is as it was a moment ago. This is in accordance with the law of impermanence, or anicca, as it's called in Pali, as put forth by the Buddha more than 2,500 years ago, and today posited by the scientific community as well. If everything is changing in every moment, then we need not feel locked into habitual reactive thinking or unskillful conditioned behavior patterns. We may lose patience and act in a way that is not in accord with the person we want to be, but that is all that happened. We acted unskillfully. A moment later, in a similar situation, we might behave quite differently. If you frequently act in an impatient or angry manner, you will undoubtedly have regrets as you cause yourself and others considerable dukkha, dukkha, suffering, stress, unhappiness. It is natural that you would want to change, and there is no question that you can. So not only did the Buddha say it, but today this is what the scientific world is saying as well, not only that you can change, but you really have no choice. You are changing, right, in this moment. So go with it. It's a lot easier. No matter what the external circumstances, your impatience can only exist within you. You develop patience by working on yourself, not by attempting to change others. Now, of course, this seems to go almost against our instinct, because when something is happening that causes us to experience impatience, the first thing we think is, oh, if I only could change that, if only he wasn't so rude, if only there wasn't so much traffic, if only, if only, if only. But the teachings say the experience of impatience is going on within you. If you want to change something, you change what is going on within. It's, it was, at its time, radical. And it still feels rather radical today, because we tend to look out that way. 
change what is wrong out there, then I will be happy. This is quite a different approach. Because some level of dukkha or stress or unhappiness, physical, mental, or emotional, however subtle, is always present. The patience of sentient beings is always vulnerable. While you want to be patient with regard to the results of your practice, you don't have to indulge negative thoughts and feelings. Look at them, recognize them, and say to them, I know you. You are a feeling. You are fear. You are doubt. You are anxiety. You have no power unless I hold on to you, and I choose to let you go. You may notice that by relinquishing negative thoughts and feelings, more positive ones begin to emerge and take their place. Encourage that positivity with resolve and gentle determination. Experiment and learn what works for you on a particular day. You are in charge of your mind. It is not the other way around. Much as it often seems like it's the other way around. My mind always just does. Your mind is not in charge. You are in charge. Buddhism teaches the significance of developing discerning wisdom and suggests that it is best cultivated through the practice of mindfulness. With perseverance, you change your mind, and old troublesome habit patterns lose their energy. It's so much about mind training. <coughs> developing, encouraging what works better. So as I've said a number of times, I think the Buddha relied heavily on the intelligence of sentient beings. Because all he said was, this has been my experience. This is what I've learned. But don't do this because I say so. You need to try, see what happens. This feels really great. Maybe you want to do that again. This doesn't work out so well. Notice that. And see if there is another option. There are practices that can specifically support the integration of patience into our relationships and daily endeavors. Generosity, for instance, is viewed as having a direct correlation to patience because the time, the time we commit to our practice is considered a great gift to ourselves and to our loved ones. Generosity is seen as an antidote to greed and clinging which cause so much of our dukkha. When aspiring students came to the Buddha, he taught them about generosity first before teaching them meditation. Living a moral life begins with an open heart and responsive to the needs of others. The term nekkama in Pali means relinquishing or letting go. It is a multifaceted progress that can be particularly challenging when we apply it to relinquishing opinions that we have held on to so adamantly. Your budding practice of patience can be seriously tested when someone is challenging your views. And as some of you know who have been around on Sundays, I've made reference to the political season, the election season when you're going to hear views that are very different from your own. And can we listen patiently? Or do we immediately shut down to those idiots? Sometimes we've been holding on to anger or bitterness 
related to a particular person or event for a long time. To forgive does not mean to condone. To forgive does not mean to forget. Sometimes to forget would be unwise, but to forgive is wise. When we offer forgiveness to another, we offer freedom to ourselves. Freedom from the unpleasant sensations of anger and bitterness. It will come as no surprise that often the most difficult person to forgive can be oneself. Through practice we can become intimately familiar with our emotional and mental states as they begin to arise rather than after we have reacted to them. As we investigate, we look in a precise manner at what is actually happening internally. For instance, at the initial signs of a disagreement, as they are just emerging, we become aware of our emotions and sensations. <clears throat> that is the actual experience, not the scenario we create with it. He is such an idiot is not part of the actual event. You have added that. I'll never get what I need, or here we go again, are likewise the add-ons that we create. There's always a real danger that we will, re we will react to our story rather than deal solely with the actual situation. One of the best ways to support the development of patience is to cultivate happiness within yourself. No one is happy every minute of the day, but we can develop a proclivity for happiness. We describe a person with such inclinations as one who sees the brighter side of things or who has a positive outlook. Happiness is a quality of mind that permeates one's entire being. As such, it is not related to external factors such as wealth or material objects. Material things can contribute to happiness, but there is the ever-present danger of clinging, grasping, and the relentless, even if subtle, desire for more and more, which is a surefire recipe for dukkha. Happy people tend to be content and grateful. Brother David Stendhal Rost said, people are not grateful because they are happy. People are happy because they are grateful. Such people do not easily fall under the influence of greed, hatred, and delusion, which were described by the Buddha as the three poisons. They are instead disposed toward generosity and kindness. They are not constantly chasing after the next object that can bring a few moments of pleasure. Pleasure is short-lived and ephemeral. Happiness, while always varying, is sustainable. The person who has developed a joyful outlook and a pleasant disposition has a much better chance of remaining patient in challenging circumstances. And then just one final thought to close with, and these are words of Patanjali, which I have read so many times on our Sunday mornings, but such great thought here. Patanjali, of course, the scholar and teacher who lived, we don't know exactly, maybe 300 years before the common era, and wrote, among other things, the Yoga Sutras, the, the ground of our yoga practice today. And he said, when you are inspired by a great purpose, all thoughts break their bonds. The mind transcends limitations. Consciousness unfolds in every direction. And you find yourself in a new, unbounded, and glorious world. You realize yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever imagined you could be.